let's start. Thank you all for coming. We're going to be talking about microservices and service mesh a little bit and application gateways. I left, and I, and, and, and I did this on purpose, I left the definition of an application gateway a little bit vague um, because what we're going to talk about is at a, at a bit of a higher level, how we adopt microservices and how we may, may migrate or modernize from monoliths to a services style architecture and reduce the risk of doing that. And to do that, there are a couple of patterns that we want to follow, a couple of really important patterns, and, and some of these technologies will come into play. So. Thank you again to the uh, JBCN organizers for having me again. This is, I think, my th third year here. Um, my name is Christian. I work now at a company called Solo. How many people have heard of Solo.io? Just kind of curious, just by raise of hands. One person? Okay, now all of you will have heard after the end of this talk. <laughs> uh, Solo is a uh, startup that focuses on helping people to be successful with microservices at a high level, but service mesh and n application networking tools at a more specific level. And, and I'll talk a little bit about this. I, I, I came from Red Hat. I worked at Red Hat for about seven years where I was the chief architect of application development or soft cloud native application development. So basically Kubernetes on up. Uh, so any of the patterns, any of the, the new micro, so I wrote a book on microservices with, uh, with Raphael from Red Hat on, uh, on microservices for Java developers. Uh, I wrote a book, the first book on Istio. I'm currently writing Istio in action for Manning, which is in an early access uh, preview. I've contributed to a bunch of open source projects, came from a Java background, contributing to things like ActiveMQ, Apache Camel, um, stayed interested in messaging systems and distributed systems like Apache Kafka, and then moved more into the, the Docker Kubernetes space. And for the last year and a half or two years, really, I've been focused on Istio. So let's get going here. Uh, I'm going to set a couple of definitions for the words that I might use through this talk. So when I talk about reducing risk, I'm talking about we're going to make changes to our system. And these systems are very complex. And in many times, we'll end up in, in scenarios or find failures or weaknesses in the system that we didn't know or we couldn't have predicted that were there. So there are these possibilities of outcomes, and some of them have negative impact, and we want to reduce the possibilities of, of that. When I'm talking about a monolith, I'm not talking about just an application that's written that co-deploys its components, right? I'm talking specifically about an older application. It's been around for many, many years. More importantly, has seen many different developers work on it. And each time a new developer goes to add a new feature on it, they just they add it, right, for expediency. And we find that over time, the architecture of the monolith starts to erode. And it becomes harder to understand it, harder to change it. And when we do make changes to it, we end up with unpredictable uh, behaviors. And when we do make changes to it, we need to organize. Everybody needs to come together and get on the same page about testing it and security penetration testing it and, and all of this stuff. So it's a big kind of stop the world and deploy this, this thing because it's, it's, it's complicated. When I talk about microservices, I'm talking about how do we take or evolve, rather, from what we had in the past where things are... Uh, a little bit harder to move and harder to change because of that longevity, because of that erosion in architecture. Not just because all the things are deployed together, but how do we, how do we evolve from that degraded state of being able to make changes and get them out fast to a architecture where we can make changes to the parts of the application that need to change faster than the others and bring those out to production and, and get those in front of our customers faster. Right, because the whole point of making changes in software is to get stuff out in front of customers. Get things out and get their feedback, get their, um, determine whether or not it provides the value that you thought that it did. Because a lot of times, just because the business has a requirement and we implement it and we deploy it, doesn't mean we actually get the impact that we want. So we want that, fa that fast iteration, we want to move fast, we want to get things out in front of customers and measure whether or not that 
provides the impact that we're looking for. Now I show this slide, I, do, I show this slide a lot, and I showed this last year, and it has continued to remain the same. This is from an older report, but the trend is still true. I said last year that we're adopting Kubernetes, we're adopting containers, we're adopting cloud platforms in general, we're adopting things like CI, CD, and automated testing, and so forth. And we're doing that for the purposes of going faster, right? We want to deploy things out to production faster. And if you'll look at these, these KPIs that uh, the state of the Dev, so this is from the state of the DevOps report. I think it's the 2017 report. Um, and the state of the DevOps report measures the impact, the business impact of high-performing teams, as well as kind of defines what high-performing teams are. High-performing teams are those that go fast and do that safely. If we see the first two KPIs on this list, we see the number of deployments and the lead time for change. That window between the high-performing teams and the low-performing low teams is shrinking. We're able to get to production quicker. We're able to move through our environments quicker and get changes from our developers' laptops into a, an environment where we can actually uh, determine impact faster. But if you look at those last two metrics, these are, these, this trend has, is continuing. The mean time to recovery, so our safety metrics, the mean time to recovery, if we introduce a failure into production, how quickly can we diagnose what it is and how quickly can we fix it? The change failure rate, how many deployments, how, how many failures we're introducing per number of deployments that we're doing. So if we're going really fast and we're introducing a lot of, of failures and, and problems, then this is, not, this is not good, right? It doesn't me matter if you're going fast, if you're just ruining everything. So we're looking at evolving and modernizing our systems. Microservices help us go faster, but we need to be able to do that safely. One of the areas that we will explore, but it's not unique to just this, is going from a monolithic style architecture to microservices. There are lots of different problems and forces and struggles to be able to do that. How many people, just curious by raise of hands, show of hands, how many people are on a journey today where you're trying to monolith, or trying to modernize from an existing monolithic style architecture to a more cloud friendly cloud native architecture of microservices is just by show of hands. So it's a decent half of the, half of the room. How many people are, do, are deploying into a cloud platform like a Kubernetes or a, or, or a public cloud? Um, you, you feel like you're doing services architecture and you're going fast. How many people are in that camp? Oh, awesome. Great. OK, so the big part, or one of the big parts of lowering the risk of modernizing or lowering the risk of making changes to a highly complex system in general is being able to control the network, control the blast radius of changes that you make. All right, so in the past, when we made changes, we would make changes to our code every three months. So I worked at a big bank. Every three months, we would deploy our, uh, our code over the weekend. Everybody would deploy at the same time. And when we said things were live, all the customers, everybody uh, at the bank could, could see it. All right, but what we want to do is be able to control the network so that the changes that we make to our system are exposed incrementally so that only a few people see it, or maybe only our internal customers or, or, or employees see it, or maybe only non-paying customers see it. And if things go wrong, we've limited that, that blast radius. So there's a term called progressive delivery, and I'll, I'll be mentioning it a, a couple more times. But So the, the ideas that we're going to look at here are controlling the network, controlling the application network with an application gateway. And the application gateway is loosely defined for now. So what we have in some instances is our monolith, and we're talking to our monolith. The traffic is going to our monolith. The monolith might have a UI might be written in Angular or React or whatever. Now, if we start to add new, new services, maybe we want to use the Strangler pattern that Martin Fowler talks about. It's a fairly popular pattern. And add new functionality as services outside of the monolith. So in this case, we're adding a new service, service A. And we're going to need to somehow update the monolith to now call out to this new service. But if 
we accept the premise earlier that monoliths are very difficult to change. And it's not always as simple as just add a new service and then change the monolith, right? Then what we, what we want to explore doing then is, is putting in this application gateway. This applica application gateway can give us a point of control in the network. And by network, I'm meaning where the requests are flowing. So not just the bytes and the packets over a, you know, a lower level network, but where the application requests, where your HTTP requests or your gRPC requests are flowing. So we, we, we add this application gateway or this mediator in the path, and now we can do things like observe how many requests are coming through the system, observe how many failures we're seeing, what are the latencies for these requests, and we can do things like traffic shift and route traffic to a new service. And we can keep some on the monolith, some to the new service where it makes sense, and the client doesn't see any of this happening. So we're kind of abstracting the, the client from these changes that happen in the system. So just to give you a taste of some of these patterns that we can do if we have this application gateway, if we have this point of control in the network, we can do things like shadow traffic. So what a shadow traffic pattern is, is requests are going to the monolith. And we've introduced a new service, service A, new capability. Let's say it's a, a recommendation engine that we want to introduce to our uh, retail site. And before we expose this recommendation engine to all of our customers and potentially take down the site if things don't go well, what we can do is take copies of, that, of those requests and send them off to our new service. And these this copy of the, of the request is out of band, out of the request path. So everything is still going to the monolith. User still sees exactly what they would have seen before. But now we get to actually test and get feedback with real live production requests on our new service. And of course, we need a way to capture metrics and logs about how the new service is behaving. So. The request goes as is, is a, cop a copy is made, it's shadowed, it's sent off to service A, and it's out of the request path. If service A fails, it's ignored. If service A returns something, it's ignored. Right? But, you, but you can actually get a real feel for how your service will behave in production with a limited blast radius using, using this application gateway pattern. Another approach is to take a small percentage of the traffic. So let's say you get past the shadow traffic stage, and you want to take 1% of your real live production traffic and send it to this new recommendation service. So you expose it in the UI, this recommendation capability, so you might use feature flags or something for that. But the actual backend requests end up now going, 1% of the traffic will end up going to our new, our new service. And again, if this thing fails, you're watching through metrics and telemetry and logs and all this stuff. You're keeping an eye on its response. Um, if, this, if this starts to perform badly or, or, or look badly, then, then you roll it back. You take it out. Another option, very, very similar to these, is to take a percentage or take a shadow of your traffic and run it through a system that will act as a control and as the new service. So what I mean is it'll actually call the old implementation and the new implementation and do a diff. And you can see both in terms of latency, how long things are taking, but as well as correctness of the data that are returned. Um, you, can, you can examine that in real time without affecting your, your customer traffic. So now this whole idea of traffic control and putting these points of control in the system is very powerful. Equally powerful is the customers when they're talking to these systems and as they start changing, you might be adding new services like we talked about. You might be adding new protocols. Maybe you want to use gRPC. Maybe you want to use GraphQL. Maybe you want to use RSocket or some new R RPC uh, way of implementing services. Your users still care about the API. Your users still care that they have stability when they're talking to their applications. 
So, you know, building a decoupling of your API that you expose to your external customers or users or business partners or other services is an important part of this equation. So API decoupling as well as traffic uh, control. Now, there's a whole slew of technology in this space that's emerging to solve these types of problems. Uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm working on a book on Istio. How many people have heard of Istio? Just curious, just raise your hands. How many people have heard of Service Mesh? The same people, <laughs> okay. Um, so th the Service Mesh pattern is a way of implementing these points of control, these network controls, at each application instance. So basically, we deploy something that looks like an application gateway next to each application instance. If you're Java developers, that's the instance of the JVM. If you're Node.js, that's the instance of the Node.js process. And when we have these points of control at each one of these instances, each one of these application instances, we can, we can get things like metrics collection. That's one of the things that I showed is very important to being able to do this type of uh, routing and uh, progressive delivery. We can get very deep metrics collection. These, these gateways, these proxies, run outside of the application. So it doesn't matter if it's Java or Node.js or Golang or Python or whatever. If we're collecting the exact same metrics, and we're implementing the exact same behavior. These application gateways, in this case, I'll talk about a specific one called Envoy, but these application gateways can manage traffic routing, weight, uh, weighted routing, um, authentication, uh, rate limiting, policy enforcement, so, um, resilience, things like timeouts, retries, circuit breakers, all of these very powerful network control features and, and pieces of functionality that every application is going to need when they build in, in, in a cloud platform. Now, Istio is one implementation of a service mesh, but that's not the only one. And I kind of feel like we're at the beginning of this, the emergence of who's going to win the service mesh competition here. Linkerd is another good alternative. Uh, they come from a company called Buoyant. Uh, HashiCorp has uh, been working on a service mesh that's starting to become more full-featured. I think they have a release coming out in the uh, next next few weeks or month at the latest uh, with with a new update. Uh, Amazon App Mesh, AWS App Mesh is also coming along. So we're starting to see, and we're going to see more announcements from from more vendors on uh, on their take on service mesh. So we're starting to see a proliferation of these implementations of how you, would, um, how you would implement these network controls using application gateways in your, in your application architecture. Last week here at KubeCon in Barcelona, the company that I work for, Solo, we, we announced with Microsoft this new spec for service mesh. Basically provides an API for being able to do things like traffic control being able to do things like metrics collection and security and policy enforcement, all of these things that are very important to lowering the risk of making changes to your system, but doing it in a service mesh abstract way, so implementation uh, agnostic way. And this is actually something that Solo, that we've been working on for the last nine months. Um, so it's always nice to see the validation from a big cloud vendor like Microsoft, but we've been working on this for the last nine months on a project called Superglue superglue.solo.io. So it's a mesh federation and management uh, system that is built on top of a, a service mesh interface or service mesh API. So service mesh, the capabilities of routing, metrics collection, security, policy enforcement, these types of things, these are nice APIs that we can call, but something needs to call them. And if we want to automate this ability to do traffic shifting and traffic routing and build this, um, this de-risking of our deployments and, and architecture changes into our build pipelines, into our automation pipelines, we need something to drive this. We need something to call into these interfaces. And we can do that with extensions to the service mesh. 
So one of the extensions that I'll talk about today is, is Flagger from Weaveworks, and they've built a, uh, an engine that automates canary analysis. So when you do this traffic shifting, 1%, 5%, 10% traffic shifting, watching the metrics, setting thresholds, that kind of stuff, um, we, we can do that in an automated way. Now, the service mesh is very focused on inside a cluster, service-to-service -service communication. So we have all of these different points of control within the applications within a cluster. Service mesh can span clusters, but that's typically done through a gateway. And even if you don't span clusters, if you want traffic to come into your cluster, into your mesh, you need some ingress mechanism or you need some um, ingress gateway. But like I said in the, a little bit earlier, that we're focused, we need to be focused on network control as well as API, API stability. So regardless of what's running in our, in our cluster, we need uh, stability. So let's look at how we might want to build this. Now, some these patterns aren't new. Amazon, so I worked at Zappos.com in 2012. Amazon was doing this kind of stuff back then and probably long before I was there. So these patterns are, are not new. You may be implementing some of them yourself, but I'm gonna show you some technology that's been purpose-built for cloud platforms, for Docker environments, for things like Kubernetes, um, or running outside of Kubernetes and, and other uh, um, um, workload or orchestration platforms. But these, these projects, these open source projects, have emerged to solve exactly this type of problem. So the first one, I'll talk about it because it's foundational. If we talk about API gateways, next generation API gateways, we're going to talk about Envoy. If we're going to talk about service mesh, we're likely going to talk about Envoy. So let's, let's take a second to, to see what Envoy is. How many people have heard of Envoy? Just curious out of the, out of the crowd. So Envoy is a service proxy or an application gateway that originated from Lyft, the ride-sharing company. And they built Envoy specifically for the purposes of going from their monolithic environment to a microservices-style environment, as well as getting visibility, getting metrics, getting telemetry, getting observability from the network, and building automated resilience, things like circuit breakers and timeout, retry, out, uh, load client-side load balancing, these types of things, into the applications. The creator of Envoy, Matt Klein, he spent his previous career at Amazon, at Twitter, and so on. They built a lot of this infrastructure in the JVM. And what he found was that for each hop, an infrastructure network at high, super high load, high, high uh, uh, throughputs, that there was this level of unpredictability, high tail latencies that they weren't able to, um, to work around. And what he found was writing a purpose-built piece of infrastructure like this in C++ helped bring some determinism to, to that infrastructure. So Envoy is a network filter at its core. It shuttles bytes and packets around. But it also has the ability to write plugins for it. So it can understand application-level protocols like HTTP, HTTP1, and HTTP2. And in, in this case, Envoy was written uh, to support a larger or, or growing gRPC implementation at Lyft, so uh, HTTP2 on both sides of the proxy. Um, since then, uh, other, other filters have been written so that the proxy can understand um, things like Dynamo, like Redis, like Kafka, like AM, the MQP protocol. And what this means is Envoy understands requests and messages that are flowing through the proxy, not just bytes and packets. And if it understands requests and messages, it can smartly do things like load balancing, request level client-side load balancing. It can do things like circuit breaking, so request level circuit breaking, things that you would otherwise have written in the past in your applications. Now we can do this outside of the applications and get consistent behavior across any um, any framework or any implementation of, of your service. Envoy does things like traffic shadowing, which I mentioned, very fine-grained traffic routing, 
and collects tons and tons and tons of telemetry. You can filter it down, but it's better to have more and filter it down than not have enough. So Envoy plays the role of this application gateway, collecting metrics, allowing you to build your services architecture in whatever protocols and whatever um, style you want in the back end. But it doesn't necessarily focus on the API. So we get this network control, but it's not very focused on, on, the, on, on that stable API that you might expose to, to customers, this part. And just to, just to point out, I've been a little bit, I haven't clearly defined exactly how, this is, these are logical architectures that we're looking at right now, not physical deployments. Because you could conceivably think that you put your Envoy proxy uh, with API capabilities next to the monolith, deploy it right next to the monolith, so that your applications, your services, your clients, are, they feel like they're talking to the monolith, but actually you have this point of control and it's able to do this sophisticated routing without changing anything in the monolith. So if we, if we take, a, take a step sideways, I guess, and look at how do we leverage Envoy and maintain and, and take all the good parts of Envoy, but then also get this ability to decouple your API and keep a stable API? Because the API is important, regardless of where you're running your, your new services. That could be containers, that could be VMs, that could be uh, functions of service or these new types of compute from the public clouds. So the API gateway pattern is the important part here. How do we expose an API, a stable API, when all the components in the back end, they're no longer deployed in a monolith. There's no longer one notion of what an application is. Your application could be a bunch of different functions. It could be uh, components written in gRPC and components written in, in HTTP or REST. And now how you bring some sense to this and how you compose an API and decouple your API from what the rest of that system looks like is where the API gateway pattern comes into, into play. And at Solo, we have an open source project called Glue, G-L-O-O, -O, that's built on Envoy that provides these API gateway capabilities. So it provides you a way to do a clean separation of, of, of your API for your users. And Glue is different from Envoy in the sense, or that adds the capabilities to understand how to route to a specific function. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about what I mean with that. Because when we're talking about APIs, we don't care about host and port. Right? You might have a service running on a particular host and port, and that's fine. But what about the specific paths for an API that you might have there? Or if it's gRPC, what about the specific functions, function calls that you can make? So we need to be able to understand those. And Glue can, Glue can understand those, route to those, transform messages to be able to meet the shape of the APIs in the back end and keep a stable decoupled API in the front end. It does all the things that you would expect from a API gateway, um, authentication, OAuth flows, uh, TLS. Uh, we can do TLS routing with SNI, rate limiting, caching. When you deploy into Kubernetes, Glue is very Kubernetes friendly. All the configuration, all of that, all of the uh, management of Glue is done using Kubernetes CRDs. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, it's just another configuration file, Kubernetes-like configuration file that you deploy. You don't have to manage any more databases to do this because Kubernetes does all that stuff for you. So again, Glue composes functions. When I say function, I mean function, like a name that represents some capability, parameters that take some shape, and return a response. They do some sort of uh, activity and return a response. Now, these parameters could be objects of some type, and they have some kind of shape. All right, and so when, when Glue is taking requests, uh, incoming requests for a particular API, and it needs to talk to, let's say we expose a REST API, because that's typically what we're going to expose, especially if we don't know who the consumers are or uh, we're exposing it for a web, web endpoint and so on. But what if we want to do gRPC on the other side? So Envoy and Glue can do that protocol 
transformation, both at the request level and the protocol mediation part. With vanilla Envoy, like I said, very powerful, we can do routing to services, to host and port. With Glue, we get more fidelity, more fine grain routing capabilities. So we can do canary releases, like I was just talking about, not just against depl entire deployments of host and port, but of individual service paths or APIs. Let me give you a quick demo of, of this. Okay, so here is, here is our glue dashboard. Now everything I'm gonna show you on this demo is gonna be through the UI. But like I said, all the configuration for a glue um, uh, proxy is, is done through Kubernetes CRDs. One is deployed on Kubernetes. It's not tied to Kubernetes. We have plugins for console and uh, using files on a file system and so on, but it's just a lot easier on Kubernetes. Um, so I'm going to show you through the UI. You, also have, you can also use the CLI. You can also use the YAML files directly. Uh, it's a little bit more convenient for a demo. So what, what we're going to do here is we see we have our application deployed. If we refresh, everything looks good. Find owners. We get some data. This is our, our, our application that we want to now extend. And we want to use the power of a control application gateway to be able to route to uh, maybe new implementations of our services. So we have this, we have veterinarians which show the name and their specialty. If we click on contact, there's nothing there. Does that zoom in? If it, it is not implemented yet, it's an error. So if we come over here to the, to the, um, the glue catalog here, we can see all of our, our services that glue has automatically discovered. Another component that, that glue has can go out into your system into your Kubernetes, into your console, into your Terraform resources, into your EC2 resources, and so on, and discover host and port, just like most discovery systems uh, can do. But it also goes additional, an additional level. It'll say, for each one of these hosts and ports, I'm going to go look, are there gRPC endpoints here? Are there REST endpoints here? Like, do we find a swagger or a gRPC reflection? Uh, and and or or if we're in uh, Google Cloud, Google Cloud or Amazon, is this? Are there lambdas? Are there cloud functions and so on? So here we we do see some REST services. We see some REST uh, or gRPC services, and then we see some ones that are um, regular applications running on, on Kubernetes. So if we click on our our default virtual service here, what we want to do is add new functionality to veterinarians, but we, we don't want to do that in the existing application in the existing Java application. Maybe we want to do uh, a new Spring Boot app. Uh, Josh Long showed a great um, demo yesterday of, uh, of Reactive Spring and using RSocket and these types. Maybe you want to do your new service in, in that. So with, with our um, Glue ga gateway here, what we can do is add a new route and say that for any traffic going to slash vet, if you can see that, uh, we're going to route this to our new a new service, pet clinic slash vets, dash vets. So we've implemented this new microservice outside of our existing application, and we'll create this new route. And we'll reorder it. If we come to back to our application and refresh the veterinarians tab, we see now that our traffic is being shuttled off to our vets service, which has re-implemented this vets functionality and added new capabilities. So we haven't changed our existing application. We've kind of forked the traffic off and uh, re-implemented that in a different service. Now we can do the same thing with contact, but instead of maybe calling a, a service that's running in Kubernetes, what we can do is call a Amazon Lambda. So if we have, which we don't right now, we can, we can add a new Amazon Upstream, so in Glue we call them upstreams. AWS, we'll put it in Glue. US East 1. And we need to give it a secret to be able to talk to AWS. Now if I click Submit, we should see, fingers crossed, we see our AWS upstream was added, but it also discovered automatically all of the lambdas that are running in, in AWS. 
So from here, we can just go back and add another route under slash contact to route to AWS. Um, contact form, so it sees multiple versions of our Lambda in this case. We'll, we'll pick the latest version. And then we also, I'm going to enable this. Let's I'm going to enable this response transformation. So another thing that I mentioned pretty quickly that, that Glue can do automatic response, request and response transformations inside the proxy itself. So in this case, Lambda is going to return us to JSON, but since we're trying to deploy or display this to an HTML page, we want to grab a com particular component of the JSON. Uh, so we'll enable the, the transformation here for Lambda. And we'll say submit. Let's reorder this one. Now if we click on contact, Cross fingers. This goes out and calls an AWS Lambda function and returns with this, this functionality. Now, on top of a proxy like Glue, a proxy like Envoy, that does things like author, uh, authentication, authorization, rate limiting, caching, uh, request routing, it doesn't do API composition though. So you, you, you get your requests to come in, and it can do all this stuff to, to decouple the API and call a backend API somewhere. But it can't, you can't take one request in and call multiple services, aggregate the data, and return it back. But you can, and we did, layer a project called GraphQL on top of Envoy. So now with this project called Scoop, which is a GraphQL engine on top of Glue, we can call back. So we, we use Envoy now, Envoy functions, all the functions, all the stuff that I talked about, how you can call back to REST or Lambda or, or gRPC or whatever. You can now use those as your GraphQL resolvers to get the data to compose a particular API that you want to expose using GraphQL. Now, I'm going to leave, a, I'm gonna, I, have, I have one more demo, I'm going to leave you with final advice. When you're looking at um, these types of patterns that we looked at, and, and, and specifically being able to control the network to be able to lower or minimize the impact of changes, to be able to recover from changes faster, and focusing on a stable API, there is definitely, and I see it, um, I might be contributing to it. There is this, there's this idea that we just got to go out and service mesh is the answer. And in the long term, long run, it is. Things are a bit volatile right now. So my recommendation is explore service mesh, understand its underpinnings, things like Envoy, try to operationalize Envoy. Um, but look at adding the capabilities of network control starting at the edge. Starting at the edge where you can get a lot of value immediately. And it's kind of familiar enough to your operations folks that they'll be able to get it. Now, what, what I'm going to show you now is how do we take this idea of reducing the risk of making changes, so implementing a canary release system, automating that, and doing that by, um, by, by driving the API of a, a application gateway. So in this case, it'll be glue. It could be a full service mesh. It could be something else, but um, we're going to look at, at doing canary analysis and release with Flagger, a project that I mentioned from, from Weaveworks, that, um, that will be driving the, um, the traffic shifting and deployments for our, our application here. And Flagger supports things like Istio, things like App Mesh directly, but it also supports SMI. So it's a service mesh interface, and Superglue is kind of the reference implementation of that. So we, it supports uh, Superglue and Glue out of the box right now. So let's, oops. let's take a look at doing that with, with Flagger. Uh, Now, this is, let's make sure we're in the right state here. This is going to be a live demo. But you'll notice, just like last year, I'm having, I'm having a script automatically typed for me, because I'm a terrible typer in front of 100 people. 
Now, this very well could fail, so be careful. <laughs> Cross your fingers for me. Um, what we're looking at here is we see we have no applications deployed yet in our, in our is, that, is that big enough? Can you see that back there? Is it all right? So we don't have any applications deployed right now. But what we're going to do is deploy a very simple pod info app. So this application just, when you call it, expose the HTTP endpoint. When you call it, it just returns the version and a some details about the, the runtime, the pod itself. So if we call it directly, or, or OK, we're going to install this load generator as well, because when we start uh, doing this canary analysis, we need metrics. We need to see how this thing is behaving. So we'll use uh, Helm to do that real quick. And now if we get our pods, we should see them start to, start to come up. Now, if we call the pod info service directly using curl, this is the type of information that we see. It's a very simple application. You can expand it um, in for your own use cases. But it's, it's very simple. It returns the version, the host name, some of these other things. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use glue to route to this pod info service. So glue is the API gateway built on Envoy at the edge that will be able to route to our pod info. Now let's apply it. So now glue knows how to route to pod info. And if we get it, we see that it's there. Everything looks good so far. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to define our canary analysis deployment. And this is using Flagger. So this is the Flagger YAML. Here, we'll, we'll scroll back up. We'll go through it. Basically, what it's saying is if you detect any changes to our pod info deployment, don't just automatically make them available to everyone. We're going to slowly and progressively control how we roll this out, both through doing a deployment, so Flagger will automa automate the Kubernetes deployment, but also through controlling the traffic, and in this case, through Glue. So what we're going to do is um, every 10 seconds, we'll check, check stats, and see how things are going. We will roll out up to 25% of the traffic to our new canary. So if we make a change, new application gets deployed, we will slowly and incrementally build up to about 25% of traffic to our new Canary release. At that point, we should be able, and you can change this. Obviously, these are configuration. But for this particular demo, in this case, at 25%, we're going to make our decision. Do we go full live or do we roll back? So we'll step by 5% at a time. And we will watch metrics, in this case, in Prometheus. Things like the re re request success rate and the request latency. So these are all configurable. You can change these. You can watch whatever metrics and whatever uh, KPIs you want to determine good or bad and whether or not to continue. Uh, but in this case, we're just using some of the defaults. So let's add that. Let's apply this. So we just created this new Canary deployment. So now Flagger, which is running in this cluster, is going to see that we created this. It's going to, and we'll keep an eye on it here, uh, it's going to register it in its system, and it's going to start the Canary process. It's going to actually do, uh, actually, in this case, it's just going to register it until we make a change. We haven't made a change yet. So we give this a second to come to a stable state. There we go. And we are initialized. And we are going to see here, if we look at, uh, the bottom pane, what we see is our client, uh, it looks like it's not moving, but it is moving. Um, it's just returning the same thing over and over and over. Uh, we're at the bottom, we're calling our service, and we can see uh, not much is changing. We're on the stable 1.4.0 version in this case, um, but things are changing. If we look up here, we can see all of the artifacts that Flagger created. Flagger created a pod info-primary deployment. 
that's what it's going to use to control the, the primary. If we look at the services, it'll show that it created a service for the primary and a service for the uh, canary in, inside of Kubernetes. And if you're not super familiar with Kubernetes, the, the, the concepts of service and deployment hopefully are uh, abstract enough that it makes sense. If we look at our upstream group, upstream group is a glue term. This is how we control the routing between uh, different services. We see 100% of the traffic is going to primary, which is what we see in the bottom. Now let's change the pod info deployment. Let's change that to use uh, a Docker image of 1.4.1. Now we see on the bottom things aren't changing yet. If we look at some of the events, we see that a new revision was detected, so that's good. Now if we keep an eye on the canaries, we can watch in the wait column, it's going to start incrementing the, the weight that it gives to the canary. So once that traffic starts to show, so it's automatically doing it, and it's using glue in this case, uh, once it starts to shift the traffic on the bottom, we should see uh, version 1.4.1, uh, maybe, at, at some point. It's only 5% of the traffic right now. We're going we're gonna to shift the traffic up to 25%, and at that point, we'll, uh, we'll go all the way to 100. We're at 10% now. We, start, we, st we do start seeing 1.4.1 start to show up in the results here. And again, it's looking at Prometheus. It's looking at the request response and the request duration, so looking at latency. And as long as it doesn't exceed a certain threshold, it's going to continue to roll out. Here you can see now we're at, we're at 15, we're at 20. Um, now this is, this, is pretty, this is pretty powerful. You can, you can connect Flagger into your CI CD system um, and use it. Like I said, start off with the edge, start off with ingress, gain some of these capabilities, understand what proxy and what proxy technology you're going to use, um, and then roll out to more of the capabilities that a service mesh might, might provide. So we see it at 25. We see it succeeded. Oh. And I am slowly running out of time. Check this out. Uh, check out the ser service mesh hub.io. If there's any questions, these things at KubeCon, these little plushies, these were so hot. These, everybody wanted one of these plushies. I think there's a secondary market for these, these, these plushies right now. Um, I have three of them, but if you ask questions, I can, I can, I can hand them out. I got time. I got two minutes. How, I got time for some questions. How many, who's got any questions about some of the stuff that I said? Or who wants a plushie? manage the traffic across them too, potentially? Yeah, so the question was, <laughs> the question was when you, um, when you have multiple clusters, and how do you manage the, the rollout of applications across multiple clusters? Um, so in that case, each cluster would have its own API gateway. Uh, but you would use um, higher level traffic management, level L4 traffic management to get uh, requests or get traffic to that cluster. Um, and then the workflow in this case for keeping things kind of in sync and behaving similarly, especially if you have identical clusters, um, is, is, is going to be uh, how you version, how you roll out those YAML files that you use to manage the configuration for the proxies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you have multiple sources of truth for Prometheus and for being able to do rollouts. So typically you would have a, uh, a Prometheus per cluster, but then Prometheus also federates, can federate itself. So you can build a single pane, pane, a single pane of glass for Prometheus across multiple clusters as well. Any other questions? Yes. You're honest. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, to 
Can you version can you can you version control the configuration? You, all the configuration you uh, apply uh, on via glue or yeah. So, so, we, so you heard the question. He has a microphone. Um, and so all of the configuration is is YAML files, right? So and the intended use of a system like this, uh, including Kubernetes, including Istio, including others, is to uh, build this into a GitOps style workflow where all of the changes, like I did the changes up there and they're very dynamic, uh, that's not, you're not gonna do that in production, right? So all of the changes, uh, and, and we're, we have an adapter for glue, we haven't built out the Git part yet, but that is, that is coming. Uh, so that all of the changes automatically go through Git as a, as a PR, and then those can go through the typical Git PR process. So the question was, could you, deploy, could you control the deployment strategy through the application? So now, this is an area where, uh, where we're really interested, I'm really interested in uh, defining configuration that is more suitable for developers to be able to do things like say, well, I want the traffic routing to be this, or I want the rollout for this particular application to be this. And so that API, that configuration, we're gonna announce something in, I think, three weeks that will uh, help solve these types of questions. Yep. Well, I'm out of time. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully you learned. I'll be here for a bit for more questions if you need.